not the way I want to do it, I want to keep it in my server and the cloud's not for me at the moment. So that's the kind of judgment you're taking. The, the, the reality is as a cloud user and a low value service, you have very little negotiation power some of the time um, and, and it really is take it or leave it. The other thing is a lot of these cloud services just skip through the general checks and balances of the internal procurement system anyway. You've got thresholds of renegotiate all contracts above 50,000, but a lot of cloud contracts can be less than 50,000. Swipe of the credit card, you've got Amazon storage services for a very low value. It's the sort of contract which is de minimis. It's going to you know, get pushed through the organization and all of a sudden you're going to find it could cause you problems because information is moving or flowing in a way that you hadn't anticipated or in a way that you hadn't you know, looked at in the, in the longer term. So um, with data on that London server, we paid little attention to global legal implications. Suddenly, we're interested in the laws you know, that are relevant to elsewhere because our data could be in that country. What touches on that data when it's in that country? What does it say about our business being in that country? But we're also, first off, going to have a little look at um, data and legislation which is you know, relevant to that um, in, the, in the country of origin. So if we're in the UK, we're holding data, if it's personal data, the Data Protection Act is going to apply. If it's not personal data, you could ignore the Data Protection Act. Um, but you know, what, are we, what are we looking at? And as I mentioned, uh, as we were sort of moving through, um, some of the most compelling propositions of the cloud, including the freedom and flexibility, are the factors which actually pose some of these hurdles. The fact you can move it, the fact it goes to someone else and then perhaps to someone else, gives you some of these you know, contract, you know, headaches in the legal department and headaches in terms of compliance. So um, a lot of laws out there are, are really seen as, um, uh, you know, haven't been designed with a cloud in mind. They're old. I'll give you a couple of examples a bit further down the line of where, you know, 1986, people hadn't even really think, thought about the internet and what that might mean to people. So it's very easy to spoil the cloud by looking at existing contractual restrictions. I've taken on all this personal data from somebody and I've said, I won't share it with anybody else or I won't send it outside of the EO. The kind of promises you've made in the past might hamper the way you can deploy the cloud solution in the future because you've got legal or contractual obligations which have been formed. You've got legal restrictions about moving data, which I'll just come on to now. And you've also got best practice about looking after things. What do you do? You know, what would be seen as a prudent thing to do if you were using information? So um, no, nothing new about this legal analysis, nothing new about due diligence, but, uh, but it's something which is not particularly uh, thought about in a long way. A lot of the contractual and legal documentation we see, particularly here in Europe, has originated from the US because providers often start in the US. A lot of software um, moved into SaaS and then moved into you know, other cloud kind of uh, areas. So we're seeing a lot of information that's been uh, of contracts which have been brought over, simply changed into English law or not even changed at all, and therefore will do things in a certain way, but they've been designed for a US market not necessarily designed for a European market. So to some extent, there's still a lot of catch up going on. Um, and one of, the, one of the main things which um, this catch up kind of misses is the EU Data Privacy Directive. Um, a complex piece of legislation coming out. I'm sure a lot of people have heard about it. There's always the examples of you know, why you couldn't find who sent your dead father flowers because um, the Data Protection Act or whatever else. It's, lost, it's banded around in the press as, with a lot of negativity. It's something which has been drafted in a very broad way um, to protect a lot of information. And because, uh, you know, in some ways quite clever the way it applies, but in, in the other way, because it's got such broad application, it can give problems quite quickly, and problems particularly in relation to cloud computing. So in the world of data protection, you've got two things. You really, you've got a data controller, the person that captures information and decides what's going to happen to that information. Um, and they're responsible under the Data Protection Act for protecting that data. And it only applies to personal data, so something which identifies a living individual. If it's not per uh, personal or it's been anonymized, you forget about the remit of this act. Um, this act derives from a EU directive, so you've got very similar laws around the whole of Europe. So wherever you go in the European Union, you've got something which has a similar impact. Now, in, in this world of data protection, you've got the data controllers. If they give it to a third party, that party is a data processor. They're doing something on behalf of the data controller in relation to the data. So you put something into the cloud, give it to a third party, and they're processing it. That, you're the data controller. Your cloud provider is the data processor. Or, or, or are they? There are a couple of nuances there. If you say if somebody is just hosting, are they really processing? There's you know, talk about changing the law, but essentially you've got that sort of polemic, two, two parts to it. 
You've also got data subjects, ultimately the people whose information it is. Now, um, basically the whole Data Protection Act has been designed to protect the data subject. You don't own data yourself as a controller, you're the custodian of it on behalf of the data subject. And if you pass it on to a third party, you remain responsible for it and you have to continue protecting it, uh, which is all very well. And then there's a whole bunch of, uh, of obligations out there, which is, you know, reams and reams of, of documents in relation to what you need to do in relation to data. Um, focusing in on three in relation to the cloud, we've got data security. You've got to keep appropriate measures to protect that data. Um, and uh, even where that data is processed by a third party, you're responsible for ensuring that third party maintains adequate measures. Um, they're called about adequate technical and organisational security measures. Um, and that's where the written contract comes in. Um, the seventh principle or the security principle of Data Protection Act is to, as a data controller, have a written contract with that third party. And that could be a click-through contract, could be a paper contract you've signed, but if you haven't got a contract in place with your provider, uh, problem um, because you're not complying with that limb of the of the test. You've also got something called fair processing practices which say if you take information off an individual, those data subjects we saw in the corner, you have to tell them about what you're going to do with their data to give them an informed choice because they have the option of giving you their personal data or not or letting you use it for certain purposes. Now in the in the past, 10 years ago, uh, we spent a lot of time drafting privacy policies. We said we won't share your data with any third party. We won't transfer your data outside of the European Union. Little statements in a policy um, which make people think, ooh, I like this company, I'll sa save my information, they can, I'll share it with them. Now, they're actually contractual promises to those data subjects. If suddenly you're going to put information into the cloud, um, hang on, you've said you won't share that information with a third party, you won't uh, transfer it outside of the European Union. You might have to go back to the data centre subjects and get some kind of consent. Um, that is one of the problems uh, that we come up with quite often in the cloud. It's a restriction of the way you've acted in the past. In the same way, if you're a processor um, and you've been given some information in order to, for example, provide a marketing campaign for email, they provide email addresses to you, you send on the email. You're acting as a processor. If you want to use a cloud provider to canon out those emails, you've got to look at the Pro Data Protection Act, but you're not the controller, you're the processor. So you've got a written contract in the background with the ultimate owner of those, or control of those email contract uh, addresses. And typically, nine times out of 10, a well-drafted contract will say, you won't share it with third parties, you won't send it outside the European Union, because that provider has got to be you know, looking after the information in accordance with the uh, Data Protection Act as well. So you've got two factors there which can really cause problems in relation to uh, using the cloud. Um, secondly, uh, or thirdly, I should say, you've also got this eighth principle which you've heard out about data transfers. And that's basically the European Union says you can't transfer personal information outside of the European Union unless there's adequate protection in place. So there's actually a moratorium which says, no, you can't take it outside of the European Union. You might have a data centre in, uh, in Pune, but you've got to do something to ensure this adequate protection. And there are a number of methodologies which you can deploy to make sure that you can move that data. Um, but if you haven't put one of those um, solutions in place, um, you're going to have problems moving that data uh, at a later event. So it, the Data Protection Act is, um, is, is really quite, quite complicated in terms of the restrictions and it will cause you some problems in the, in the cloud. If we just move, move on in, in that respect, it also causes some problems when you move data in and out of the European Union. So I've talked about moving data out. Well, if you're a US entity and you've got personal data and you store it on servers in the EU, that personal data can become subject to the Data Protection Act within the EU. So you've got it stored in France. That data suddenly becomes subject to the Data Protection Act or the equivalent in France. And that talks about providing notice to individuals, treating it in certain ways. Now, if you're a US company and you're not regulated to the same extent as European processors, why would you suddenly want to put your data in France and take on all this new burden of legislation? And I've got a cloud provider um, client here, based here in the UK who's actually lost customers from the US because of the risk of putting data on a data center in the EU. It don't, doesn't want to, you know, customers in the US don't want to submit themselves to extra legislation. So actually this uh, client of mine has actually had to build a data center in the US to store data in the US to ring fence it outside of the European uh, data protection regime. Um, there's all kinds of issues here, particularly around discovery and a conflict of jur jurisdiction. Um, and you know, this is some of the, 
the reason why you're seeing all these promises from providers about talking about ring fencing data, keeping it in one place. If you start moving it on, you've got a problem, you need to overcome those hurdles and there are methodologies to do that. But if then in turn it moves from Pune to Brazil, you know, because a database analyst is tuning something and you can pull it up a screen in Brazil, that's an onward transfer, it's sub-processing and there are other restrictions. Um, so yeah, it's definitely something that, that counts. But geography can count as well, as I mentioned. And just, just quickly look at um, some of the restrictions which might cause problems in the cloud. Because um, frequently, geography is yeah, used to protect rights or restrict permissions. So if you've got a software license, it often says, OK, you can use this software, but only in the UK. It's a territorial restriction. Um, now, if you're putting something on the cloud to use that software remotely via SaaS, and it's, it's yours, it may be the, you, know, you might be using it on a platform in Pune. Well, actually the software that you intend to upload to the server is restricted under license. You might have to go back and extend that license. So again, due diligence will look at your license terms and work out whether you've got the right to use this in a different way. You might not have a right to use it on a third party data center. It might be licensed only for use on your servers. So you know, looking underneath the hood in terms of you know, what's there in the, in the licenses. In the same way, we've talked about privacy policy, that statement, we will not transfer your personal data outside of the EU. It was great five years ago, it won you business, but now you want to you know, uh, outsource to a cloud provider, all of a sudden, oh, that privacy promise is going to cause me issues. Um, come across a slightly more remote chance, this one, export control law. Um, got a client that does a lot of uh, particular research, and they had the ability to access some quite powerful servers uh, offshore in order to process some of the data they had from some of the testings that they do. But um, they uh, process uh, uh, uranium in relation to civil nuclear power use. However, um, there's also dual use for uranium and uranium processing. And therefore, you know, taking the technology and the processing offshore was actually going to give them an export control issue. Um, they couldn't take that data offshore into the cloud to leverage this grid computing solution um, because um, export control said you had to be a license because it could be dual use. And you could see that in encryption technology or other areas. So there are other bits of law where geography, you know, it's all very well keeping something in the UK. Um, but, you know, what happens, you know, there are other bits which might prevent you going out into the cloud. Um, finally, a couple of other examples. Um, which um, came up in some of the questions to Cloud Circle in terms of, and they're particularly US ones, but they typically get the press because there's a lot more you know, cloud service and particularly SaaS out in the US. Um, data in the cloud can suddenly become subject to another jurisdiction simply because you move it. If it's in the UK or as well, move it out into a data center into the US, it's stored in the US, it's in transit on the way to the US, so it'll be passing over um, ver various um, uh, communication uh, in order to get out to that data center. And then you, you start exposing that data potentially to other types of legislation. So one that comes up, the Patriot Act, Patriot Act um, again, in one of these knee-jerk reactions to 9-11, but um, effectively gave something called federal letters or national security letters, which can be used to require carriers to turn over records and data concerning uh, individual customers. So if it was ring-fenced in the UK, uh, nobody can access that because you've got, you're within the territory of the UK and the jurisdiction of the UK host in the US. You open yourself up to you know, a federal letter under the Patriot Act. Does it matter? It, it depends. You've got to look at your risk profile. Is this just something people are banding around or lawyers are picking up on because it's just another reason to throw something at a cloud or you know, write a negative cloud article? Or actually, if it's email and you know, you're in the defense business, is it actually something that you want uh, to be accessed by the US government? There's a suspicion of government. It depends where you are. You've got Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or FISA, um, which are search warrants which are issued from a secret court in the US to get communications. There's a gag order which says you can't tell people uh, about what information is being provided. That's something which uh, you know, causes some people a problem. Um, and you, know, you don't want to expose yourself to that by doing something in the US. There's a lot of press in Canada at the moment about both of these pieces of legislation because um, Canadian government and public sector um, tenders have been going out. US companies have been bidding, but then they've been struck off the list because Canadian public procurement officials don't like the potential of the Patriot Act uh, hitting in them. So US cloud providers are losing business because they're based in the US. They're actually having to move services and functions to Canada in order to win a piece of that Canadian market. So that's an example where the territorial issues you know, can really bite. You've also got the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which uh, is 
designed in 1986, not kept pace with technology. This is something you hear banded around an awful lot. Uh, effectively, if you have a computer in your own home or 